Hi everyone. Good that you're still around. Time for the last session of developer, developer, developer. I need to say it three times. I will leave with the exclamation mark at the end. Um, thanks for being here. I'm Neil Stanis, and first I want to just briefly go through the next slides, which you probably have seen a couple of times a day already. But uh, first, code of conduct. Be aware of it, right? Just be uh, friendly to everybody. If you want to read it more, there's the link at the right side of the screen, the right bottom side of the screen, and you can read it through. Um, if you enjoy the event and if you want to like donate, then consider donation to the National uh, Museum of Computing. I honestly haven't been there. Hopefully I will be able to be there next year, but it sounds interesting uh, to have like a view of what happened with computers over the past, right? And, and these people need the money, especially right now. So make sure you drop in to that one. And the last one, of course, is sessions cannot take place without all the sponsors that help out this in this case. And there's a variety of companies. Um, yeah, so that you're aware of it. And if you want to be social, if you want to tweet, of course, make sure you pro put in the proper hashtag and the at developer day handle and then you get to go. So with that out of the way, um, we're going to talk about the rise of software supply chain attacks and I'm going to touch the topic on how secure is your .NET application. First, it's always polite to introduce yourself with a big picture on a on the slide. So my name is Neil Stanis. I'm from the Netherlands, if you probably have noticed due to the accent, and I work as a security researcher for Veracode. I have a background in .NET development, so I've been developing with the first bits of .NET. And I've also been involved with application security consultancy and ethical hacking and uh, a lot of those things. And right now I'm combining all that work into my single role and I mostly focus on what we do for static analysis for .NET applications within Veracode. If you want to talk more about that, come see me afterwards because today's topic is going to be the rise of software supply chain attacks and we're going to see how secure is your .NET application. I think in general, if we look at the way that we, I myself also started out developing in 2000, the early 2000s, and how what we're at right now, stuff has changed in a big way and the way that we write our software the way that automation took like its place into it like deployments build servers everything every moving part has introduced a lot more complexity in our supply chain it also has a lot more risks and based on a .NET application i'm going to talk you through some of the examples and some of the things that we can do of course to make sure that we have less risks in that and we're going to do that based on the following agenda First, I want to do some hacker history and I'm going to go through that quickly because we only have 45 minutes because I then want to make sure that we get to the point where we're going to talk about a development of a .NET application and, and uh, dissect its supply chain and focus on the different stages in our supply chain in order to do the right thing. And then the third bit is, of course, we need to make sure that we take the better, like better countermeasures in order to do a better job. And then at the end will be conclusion and Q&A. Always feel free to drop your questions during the session in the chat. I will hopefully keep an eye on, on the Q&A and if I can answer it right away, then I will do it. And otherwise, always possibility at the end. If we look at hacker history, uh, the first occurrence of the word hacker or like the first hacker things you saw had to do with freaking, which is, has to do with phone hacking, right? So uh, the picture on the left side you see over here is something they call a blue box that allows you to emulate phone tones and you can just make phone calls for free. That's eventually what was done and a lot of social engineering. On the right hand side, there's the first article that was published in a magazine in 1963, which talks about hackers, like the word hackers for the first time, and talks about telephone hackers that were taking over some kind of telephone system. I'm referring to a lot of stories. Um, all my links and the, the sources of these stories are inside the notes of the slides. And at the end, I will have a GitHub repo that has including the demo and the slides. And you will also find a version with notes that will have the links. So don't feel like say if you're missing out, there's always the, uh, the source at the end. So at some point in time in the 90s, systems became connected, right? So systems became connected to the Internet or network infrastructure to a company and tools like Satan or Nmap were introduced. Uh, Satan was the first uh, vulnerability scanner and exploitable exploitability tool that was created by Wietse Venema, a Dutch guy and Dan Farmer. Uh, and after that, there was like Nmap, which is a tool you can probably, like you've probably seen if you're involved with, let's say, a pen test. And if you scan a server for open ports, then you will probably use Nmap, right? So these tools allow you to 
um, determine the so-called attack service of a server and then focus on how you want to hack it. Then we move more to layer seven, how we call it, right? The application layer. And in 1996, LF1 uh, published an article inside the Frag magazine, and these articles can still be found online, and where he talks about smashing the stack for fun and profit, which is technically the first article about buffer overflows, where he explains like, hey, if you have a C buffer, if you copy data into it and it's too big, then there might be stuff going wrong and code execution and so on, right? There's a lot of stuff that might uh, happen based on that. Um, later on, I found out that this is technically not the first article that was written because that was done by Mudge of the Loft and two of other Loft members, though, those are the founders from Veracode. They started out Veracode in, in 15 years ago, so it, it's, it's a funny story to tell. Similar accounts to, let's say, SQL injection. You probably have heard of that one. The first occurrence that was like published was in 1998 by a hacker with the handle called Rainforest Puppy. And explanation about, hey, you can influence logic of queries if you if it's not properly sanitized, and you can dynamically influence what it's executing, right? Uh, so resulting in SQL injection. So what we then saw is more like evolving layer seven, and then automation came in place. And then in, in the early 2000s, we came across a couple of worms, how they call it, right? Code Red or SQL Slammer. Code Red was targeting IIS servers. SQL Slammer is the other one that was more like connect, like. SQL servers that were directly connected to the internet could be hacked in that way. And the thing that you see over here is the payload that was tied to code red, right? IS server, Unicode book, I believe, allow you to overrun a buffer and execute stuff. So what then happened is, of course, that Bill Gates in 2002 sent out an email to all Microsoft employees explaining like, hey, we talk about trustworthy computing. We talk about security that needs to be put in from the start, right? You cannot bolt it on at the end. And, and, and that's exactly what this memo was about. Um, so with that whole evolution, the move from hacking to different layers, I think if we look at software architectures right now and the stuff that we developed, in the beginning we had monolithic applications, so that's what I did also, like creating one single installer for a customer, handing it over to the IT department, say like, hey, you need to install this on your local server and then you're good to go moving towards, let's say, microservices or even serverless, what we're doing right now. The, the granularity of the software that we've been writing is, is become a lot more smaller and also a lot more moving parts, right? Um, it's not tied to that single deployment that's done from that model. It, no, maybe you're even deploying on a more frequently basis, like hourly a day. I don't know. That, that solely depends, of course, on the system that you're writing. But it has become a lot more granular and a lot more smaller. And that also has changed the way that the software has been written and also introduced a lot more complexity in the software supply chain. And that's the topic in essence that I want to cover. And I usually start out with an analogy of a supply chain that can be like, used as the example for software, uh, software development, right? And if you look at car manufacturing, there's a similarity, right? At some point um, in the beginning of the factory, a car starts out at a chassis and during out all the stages of its production, stuff will be added to that car. And at the end, when it rolls off the factory lane, there is a car that will be sold to the customer, right? But in each step, value will be added. There will be parts added. And if we look at, let's say, a big German car manufacturer, on average, a car will have like 10,000 parts and 2,600 different suppliers will hand over those parts that will be put on that car, right? So keep in mind like how much different companies will have small bits and pieces inside that car before it drives off the factory, right? And everything that has been done throughout that manufacturing process and all the steps that will add value to the end product is called the supply chain. And of course, if we look at software, we can say exactly the same, right? Um, at the beginning, there's a developer that might run code that will be put inside a source repo. In this case, I'm showing all the Azure ecosystem icons, but keep in, be, in mind, be aware that this is just interchangeable with every system that you use, the GitHub Actions, GitLab, it doesn't matter for that matter. Um, it's, it's all the same, right? The problems are the same. So source repo um, will, be will contain source code that will be committed by the developer. It will introduce maybe third party libraries and packages that, that are then needed. Then it ends up at the build server. The build server will have a trigger that will grab the source, that will grab the dependencies, that will build it that probably, hopefully, will do some Q&A, some testing on, on the packages itself before it eventually maybe gets built into a Docker image, put into a container registry, and then run on, on a Kubernetes service, right? So 
technically speaking, this is also a supply chain, starting out with code that's being written by a developer at the beginning and the end product, which in this case is a container image that you will deploy on your Kubernetes cluster that will then serve your customers, right? So similar, a lot of similarities. And I want to just briefly touch all the different areas and then define some security risks that we're facing. And let's first start out with the developer in this case. A developer needs a machine. And when he starts out developing, if you join a company, there's hopefully an IT department that will hand you over a machine that you can use. And most of the new machines will have the ability to do secure boot and have a trust, trusted platform module on, on it, right? Which to some degree gives you a guarantee that um, the, 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 the BIOS or the firmware of that hardware has not been tampered with, right? So that there is some, some guarantee on that. If you're then developing software, dealing with customer data, intellectual property, it would make sense to also encrypt the disk of that system, right? Make sure that the operating system is, 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 uh, is completely up to date, but also hardened because you don't want to have unnecessary software running on even on your development machine. But let's say if we can assume that this is all being put into the right spot and that we can trust this. Um, this, the question that still remains based on this is like, hey, but can we trust the hardware that's inside of the system? And um, if you're like a security guy and maybe a bit paranoid, then um, I would say no. And there is a nice talk that's done by um, Andrew Wang, also known as Bunny, at Blue Hat uh, Israel and of the 2019th edition of that, where he talks about the supply chain security related to hardware and how hard it is to dissect if something has been tampered with or not, because most of the things that they can do with chips is also similar when you just do manufacturing of those chips. So this, that's really hard to do to distinct that. If you're interested in this, this is a good talk to watch and he will show you like what will be the different ways on how chips can be um, uh, can be manipulated without you even noticing it. So right now, let's just assume software installed on your laptop development machine is in place hardware we can trust it right um what about the tools that we need on our machine itself so myself i'm using a macbook for like all my my.net stuff that i'm doing um and there's no like real good place to go to to install tools that will support my work um and one tool that has been written for that matter is something called homebrew right so if you need to have open vpn installed or, SS, or open SSL for that matter, or maybe even Docker or Python or a different version. Homebrew is definitely a, a good spot to go to. But if you then look at how Homebrew needs to be installed, you just put trust into the fact that you download an SH script, a shell script from a GitHub repo in this case, and just execute it against your system. And it would make sense to just check out what that script contains before you continue, right? Because how can you just be sure to trust that's 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 what's inside, right? At least make sure that you take a peek into it. And if people say that's only a Mac, then I would say like, hey, if you're doing chocolately on Windows, then you're definitely in the same spot, right? There are similar issues. And the funny fact is that even if you look at the install pages that they have, they tell to you that, hey, of course you can trust us, but it would always make sense to review the install script that you're downloading from us in order to make sure that there's nothing in it that you don't expect to be in it, right? Because that's a, that's a thing, and there's a definitely a big piece of trust you put in it if if you're like developing and if you just run these tools against your machine. So hardware is in place. We have installed the tools that we need in order to connect to different machines and so on. What about IDEs? What will happen with IDEs? And in uh, May of 2020, uh, the GitHub security team published an article about the Octopus uh, scanner malware, and that turned out to target um, the IDE, the NetBeans IDE that you can use for Java development. And what that IDE was infected with is that it was like in putting inside a piece of malware in each of the jar that was produced with it, right? So really targeted type of attack on an IDE and each of the artifacts um, of that IDE that will be built and put out um, contained that malware. And first you can say like, hey, but what's the value of that? The, I think if you look at developer persona and then within an organization, he, he or she always has access to a lot of resources within the organization, right? And 
also the conclusion that the GitHub people gave is like, hey, this is a pretty targeted attack. Why don't you focus on a build server? Because then the audience or like the spread you will get from it might be a bit bigger than just focusing on a specific IDE. So this definitely has all the aspects of something that was targeted. Um, but what's what's behind it? Like, I think right now there's still not any full story on it, but this is a good story about that. So as I said, I do a lot of my work on on a Mac and I also rely on VS Code and I love VS Code because if you see the amount of things you can do with VS Code and how how short it has been around, but uh, also all the things you can do with it. I think there's no programming language you, should, you cannot like program with it, right? There's always an extension available. You can just use it. Keep in mind that VS Code itself, um, it's community, also community developed, right? For a big portion of it and itself is built on top of Electron. And if we look at Electron itself, uh, this is a graph which you can uh, look into and npm.brufo.com allows you to take a package and then have a full dependency graph, including transitive dependencies that, that that's like part of that, right? In this case, we see that Electron has 82 dependencies and each of these 82 dependencies have in total of 110 maintainers. So 110 people like community driven will develop those dependencies that will end up in the electron. But these are only the maintainers. There will be thousands of contributors also on top of that, right? And this is electron and then VS Code uses electron, but be aware that tools like Slack also use electron, right? Maybe even Teams, I don't know. I believe there's also some RCE that was published this week on electron uh, in, in, in the Teams instance, but um, there's a lot of people that touch that code, right? So be aware of that. If you pull in a tool, then of course, then I, I trust uh, communities, but it's always oh, better to verify to make sure that we're like on the same page and everybody does uh, everything. Because if there is one person that has bad intent in that, then it might backfire, right? And of course, VS Code itself also still has security issues. And in August of this year, there was a JSON remote code execution vulnerability inside of VS Code. And even before that, that was one related to Python. So each of the extensions, of course, have their security issues that you need to be aware of and it needs to be patched. And patching is, of course, hard because after the fix was done for the previous CVE, I think uh, a couple of months later, then it turned out that it wasn't fully fixed, right? So it's still a moving piece and it's it's good to be aware of it. And you need to make sure that you update VS Code and all the extensions that you use and please turn off the ones that you don't use in order to make sure that you reduce those risks, right? So moving on, let's say we can assume that the developer machine is in place, hardware is trustable, we have the software installed, we can also trust that. So now we're at the point where we're going to develop software and the developer needs to commit code to a source repo. What could then possibly go wrong? That's the question we're going to answer next. A development machine itself needs to communicate with package managers in order to get pieces that you need, right? If you go, if you do a .NET new inside of a console, then the first thing it will probably get, it will, might get uh, new get packages from the local cache, but it also might get them from the internet. And um, a lot of those communications, of course, all rely on transport layer security or TLS, which is a root authority trust type of system. Um, and it has issues. We can probably talk about it for another hour if we want to. Uh, there's a really good threat model that Qual has created, which is available on SSL Labs, and that's inside the links of these notes, that will explain to you what the different problems are in this whole story. Also, TLS ciphers have their own issues. So let's say, for example, 1011 had the heart bleed and uh, the, the other branded vulnerabilities tied to it. Um, and that's, uh, that's, of course, is an issue. Luckily, like NuGet don't allow you to use those TLS ciphers anymore, I think since November of last year. So that's, that's a good thing. The other thing that we need to be aware of that if we go on the internet, we need to resolve names, right? And there's DNS, of course, in the whole story. Um, so if you go to NuGet.org, it needs to be translated to an IP and then you can go to that address. Of course, there can be rogue domain services and that might help out. Um, DNSSEC has been introduced in order to sign uh, public private key pairs, sign uh, DNS responses, and then in order for the requester to verify if that response came from an authority that he or she trusts, right? So that helps out. 
DNSSEC has not been turned on by either NuGet or GitHub, right? So that, that's an issue. I think that can be an additional layer of security that they could introduce in order to give us more guarantee of where like, hey, you're really talking to GitHub or to, to NuGet for that matter. Um, so network connectivity, let's move on. What's next that we need as a developer? And that's of course credentials, right? And credentials can be stolen. And what we see over here is an article from July 2019 where um, it seemed that the canonical GitHub account was stolen. And I think it was just ordinary credential theft. Keep in mind that canonical are the people behind the Ubuntu distribution, Linux distribution. And at the point where this article was written that they, um, they say like, hey, it appears to be safe. However, we're investigating. So that means that they don't know exactly what happened. But I believe at some point somebody still had access to create projects, right? And could influence source code that's in the GitHub repo of the Ubuntu and that might end up in a distribution or a release of the Ubuntu um, Linux distribution. Uh, I believe that was not that that didn't happen, but um, that's of course a problem. And you would say like, hey, OK, smaller groups suffer from this. No, uh, bigger companies like even like Microsoft also, of course, need to deal with credential theft. It's just a thing that happened. And I believe um, what happened also in summer of this year is that uh, some credentials were stolen and somebody had access to a GitHub accounts of Microsoft, which included some of the products, which were then um, the, the hacker group tried to sell it on the dark market, which eventually did not happen, I believe. So credential theft happens, right? And what can we do in order to safeguard ourselves uh, would, of course, be something like multi-factor authentication. And I would definitely encourage everybody to use multi-factor on let's say your source repositories or the, the thing that you use in order to do your development work. Uh, Multi-factor, two-factor authentication, of course, includes, let's say, a code generator like OTP codes, as you see over here, like you type in your username, password, and you need to put in that code that will be the additional factor in that whole equation. And then um, if somebody steals your password, then he doesn't have uh, this code. So that's the additional factor that will safeguard the account, right, from misuse. So that's a good thing. If there's something I want you to take away from this talk is use multi-factor authentication on all the accounts. <laughs> a third thing you can do on top of that is, uh, let's say if you're using a Git-based system, there's also something called Git commit signing, and that can be an additional factor on this, right? So there's also a public cry for Keeper. You will tie up with the Git commits that you're doing that will also sign those Git commits. And then if you configure it properly within GitHub, let's say, for example, then people can see that you are like verified and that's a commit that's done by somebody who is verified. So even if somebody's credentials are stolen, including that OTP code for some matter, then this might be an additional layer to distinct if an account was being um, um, misused or not, right? Because if somebody always publishes under verified with, with signed commits, then and it doesn't happen at some point. That's a smell thing, right? That should not happen. So an additional factor for that matter, but only then related to commit signing. So we talked about third party libraries, of course. So we talked about committing source code, communicating. Now we're at the point where we're going to pull in a third party libraries. And if you are, let's say, doing stuff with NPM, then uh, in 2018, uh, in November 2018, it turned out that an NPM package called the event stream was hacked. And that package had like a 2 million a weekly download count, which is pretty significant. And that was all due to the fact that the event stream itself was quite minimal as a package, but it's a transitive dependency of 2000 other packages that rely on that, right? Um, what happened, I believe, is that somebody jumped on the team and started contributing, right? Because the event stream itself was pretty still. There was not much active development done. And at some point, somebody beca uh, became the maintainer of that package. And decided to um, create a malicious version to publish, which eventually targeted specific Bitcoin wallets to do cryptocurrencies from somebody. So not such a sophisticated attack, but somebody was able to put that in. And keep in mind that if you have that download count of that package, then in this case, the supply chain of event stream was hacked by a person with bad intentions, but it also would mean that the supply chain of your own software that rely on this package is compromised, right? That's that's something that's tied, that's close, closely tied to each other. So that's a bad thing. Um, so let's move on from the development space. Let's say right now we're at the point where the software needs to be built. And what could possibly go wrong with the build set? So that, that, that's the next topic I'm going to cover. So um, similar things that we have seen 
over here is, of course, if we build software, we need service, we need hardware, and then we get up with the same story I talked about with a development machine. Like, what about the hardware? Can we trust it, right? There's a piece of vendor trust also. If you have, let's say, hosted build agents on Azure or, or, or AWS or some other cloud vendor, you put a lot of trust in them, right? I, I would say um, I would trust a bigger company a bit more because they definitely know what they're doing, right? Because it's a bigger scale, but it will be good to have some common sense of saying like, hey, this can be a risk. Similar accounts to the TLS issues I talked about before. And what about, um, let's say, Docker images or Docker layers that get compromised within, let's say, a Docker hub or a thing that you're using. Um, but I was a bit astounded of, and I think it's still the case. So turns out that um, Docker image and access to the Docker Hub doesn't uh, force you or do doesn't have multi-factor authentication enabled. And I believe right now it's still in beta. So um, yeah, that, that's of course a thing, right? If your Docker Hub account gets uh, compromised and somebody is has the ability to build an image and then share it across everybody that consumes it, then that, that's of course a big risk, right? Um, and aside from that, build servers itself or SDKs that are used on it can also be compromised. And a good Example is something that happened on July of this year with Twilio, and it's 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 quite. A, um, I think it's this is a nice example because, um, to some degree, they have like a task router SDK, a JavaScript task router SDK, that's being built. But at some stage in that build process, I believe, and if you are like interested in all the details, they've written it out on their blog. You can read through what happened, but it consumes files that come from an S3 bucket on AWS. And that S3 bucket was not fully secured. People could write files to that. So somebody decided to replace a file that eventually ended up in this SDK because it consumes, right? So a single file access somewhere on an S3 bucket ending up in your SDK, compromising the whole supply chain of everybody that uses this SDK in their software. So quite significant, small bit. They fixed it quickly, I believe. It's a small time we know. And I like the fact that they're transparent about it. I think that's the key, right? Why would you shove something as under the carpet and say like it didn't happen? I think that's a bad thing to do. Um, so this is an SDK, but it also happens with build servers. And in 2019 at the AppSec Village in DEF CON in Las Vegas, which is like one of the biggest hacker conferences held, somebody talked about uh, Webmin being backdoored. And what, what happened is that um, I think over a period that more of more than a year, somebody had persistent access to a build server that was reused by the webmin build in order to build the packages and it's a physical machine right so that was being installed somewhere that was being run and somebody was able to get there and and, and stay inside that server and eventually dropped some additional software inside of each of the um each of the builds that were being produced so quite 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 a long time period um and that's of course like keep in mind like everything you put in place even commit signing you've done all the checkboxes we talked about before then this single this single build server being compromised still is the problem for your whole supply chain right that single step in in the whole in the whole thing so i think we're like nicely on time because right now we're focusing on a bit more like um looking into how can we fix the problems right so we, we focused on problem spaces like really tied to that specific area, like a developer pushes source code that needs to like it needs to have credentials in, right? But how do we have the guarantee that that, sor that source that's been checked in at the beginning of the software supply chain is also that code that that's eventually used inside the build that will be released, right? That whole chain, like car starts out and rolls off the factory line. How do you have the guarantee that that definitely is the car that was intended to be built and there's nothing wrong with it and, and software exactly the same. So we need to make sure that we sort out a couple of problems in order to tackle this because now we're moving more to fixing this issue. And one key stone for this whole thing to happen is something that is called reproducible or deterministic builds. And what I mean by that is that somebody should be able to grab source code from, let's say, a public repo, um, build it, and then compare it to, let's say, a release that's been done from that component. So you should be able to go up to NuGet, get the Newton soft JSON version, uh, build it, but also grab the package from NuGet and then 
byte-wise, it should be exactly the same because how, the, how could you other, there's no other way for you to verify if the, that's the source code that's inside um, that, that package, right? You want to make sure that that integrity has not been compromised throughout all the steps that's being taken. And, and as I said, reproducible deterministic builds are a keystone that we need in order to do that. But unfortunately, it's also a pretty hard problem because there's a lot of moving parts in a build system itself that will influence its deterministically, like its ability to be deterministic all the time. So being consistently the same, and that you can do a byte by byte comparison of a, of a library that's been pushed out. So if we look at .NET, uh, Roslyn version 1.1 started supporting some kind of determinism in how and how items are emitted. And the definition that they have, and that's uh, that's inside of a GitHub design document that's inside the notes. It says that it um, based on given same inputs, the compiler output will always be deterministic, so will be the same. But keep in mind that inputs can be a really broad thing, right? So the, you talk about source code, but you also talk about uh, SDKs that are installed on, on the build server, right? The tools that are installed. Those are all things that will influence how the, the how the compilation is done, in which order, and how then eventually the DLL that will be compiled, like the end product, will look like, right? Uh, all these inputs can be found. And for the .NET Core, by default, this is done, but keep in mind that it also is influenced based on how your build server is being uh, created. And there's even some next steps for people also template out how you need to build your build server in order to be deterministic, right? And that's the next step, uh, which I haven't included in this slide. But as I said, for .NET Core, this is definitely uh, sufficient and go check out the design documents in order to see how you can leverage that. So we talked about deterministic and let's move back to the automotive industry because I still think that they have solved some of the problems that we're still facing in our software supply chain, looking at car manufacturing in general. So what we see over here is a car that has been completely disassembled, disassembled and they put down all the parts. So there's a Dutch car magazine that I've been reading a while and they always had like after 100k kilometers, they will completely tear it down and then look at how good the parts are after that car has been driven for that long, right? But um, I think we have all been in the situation where we got a recall from our car manufacturer or from our dealership saying like, hey, please bring back the car to our like facilities because we want to replace that part because let's say uh, you do something wrong with the seatbelt and um, yeah, seatbelt is in essence, of course, for uh, safe driving. So I would definitely like to have that one replaced if there's some malfunction inside of it. So for some reason, car manufacturers are really good at determining if the car that you drive have a specific part inside of it, right? Because that's the whole basis on how you can do this type of recalls for that car saying like, hey, there's a malfunction and we need to replace this part. So let's look at a, at a example, like a next example uh, like this. So let's, this hypothetically car supply chain that we're gonna talk through. So, and it's all about disc brakes that will end up at a, at a, at a car at some point. Um, to start out creating disc brakes, we first need to have steel. So let's say the Tata Steel Factory, which is one that's in the Netherlands over here, takes iron ore that comes from Sweden, that will produce steel, that will then, of course, be certified, that will be tested according to all regulations and all standards that need to meet with that steel. And that steel batch will then have an identification number. In this case, it's one, two, three, four, but just some unique identification that allow you to track that specific batch of steel. Let's say that steel then ends up at a Bosch factory that will then create disc brakes out of it, right? That will take that steel that comes from that batch that originates from the factory, they will also do their own manufacturing process. They will make sure that it's all twisted and certified according to the ECE R90 standards, which I believe really is a disc brake standard, right? Um, they will also have a serial numbers tied to that disc brakes, and then those disc brakes might be distributed across different brands, right? So let's say for Volkswagen, Kia, Vauxhall, for that matter, doesn't doesn't it's all the same, right? But they will then take that part that will be identified. Then at some point, a car gets put together in the supply chain of cars. And they will put on those disc brakes that were just being produced that we talked about, but they also put on that exhaust system. They will also put on those tires, right? And that end up being a car that's being identified with a vehicle identification number or a VIN. 
And that's a whole piece of administration. If you tie those like streams together, then you're able to do that, right? So if at some point uh, Teda calls out to Porsche, like, hey, you've took take you've taken a batch of this steel from us, and we're we, we've been testing it more thoroughly, and we see that there is an issue, then of course Bosch is able to correlate it back to their products, and then they can do a recall and say, like, hey, that car that has been manufactured at that plant with this disc brakes on needs to go back and needs to have replacement disc brakes put on because of safety issues, right? So that's a pretty solid administration. And I believe from software development perspective, we need exactly similar administration. And um, the companies like Microsoft and Google have recognized that this is an issue and there's a lot of initiatives starting out. And it's also something they've put down as a software bill of materials or SBOM. And what a software bill of materials is, is an industry standard that will describe the software and that will describe what's inside of it, right? So it has an aspect of like who created it, right? Um, what's the product that you're dealing with in this case? So the disc breaks, right? The serial number, or if it's a small component that's used across multiple things, then you need to identify it for some reason. Can we say something about the integrity? Is the project an altered? Um, licensing, creation, how was this product created, right? Does it meet all the requirements? And what type of materials were used, right? What source is used in order to build this component that's then being used inside your software? One good example is a project called Cyclone DX, which is a lightweight S-bomb that will allow you to produce a dependency graph of all third-party libraries that you use inside your, inside your software. Cyclone can do a lot of different technology stacks from JavaScript, Java.net to um, a lot of other things. You can check it out on their website. And Cyclone itself originates from a, a project called the OWASP Dependency Checker. But it's a nice XML structure document that allows you to in, like put down the packages that you use and the versions that you use inside your software, right? So let's say if you build your project and if you also produce an S-bomb at the end and put it with the artifact itself. Let's say at some point there is a CVE published that there is a security issue with a specific version of a library that's inside your software. Then you can do that recall yourself because you know, like, hey, we have built this product that we've released over there, or we have built this product that we have deployed on that customer site that includes this library and it needs attention because there is a fix. Um, there's also the NTIA, which is an organization inside of the US that's a telecom uh, association that will that has a lot of good documents on SBOM. Ned Friedman is a, a guy who also did a couple of good talks at RSA of this year. You can find on the internet, um, but they have some good documents on how we should take this thing to the next level as as um, as, as the software development companies or as as an industry as a whole. Um, an additional good talk to see is one that was done by Mark Rosinovich, right, the CTO of Azure also at RSA of this year, where he talks about so supply chains and open source security in the same way that I'm talking about development of a specific app right now. Um, the end conclusion is SBOM. And luckily for SBOM, there's also some academia that started out creating some tools that allow us to do a better thing, right? And one um, framework that allows you to do software integrity of supply chains is a tool called Intoto. And in total allows you to describe your software supply chain. And we will go to a demo after this, so I will just talk you through a bit. But it allows you to, aside from the fact that you know that you need to have source in order to build grab the dependencies, it also describes you the steps that will be taken as an intermediary step and what the in and output of that step would be. And in combination with some cryptography that's public privately public private key pairs used. It allows you to sign off artifacts that you can then verify at the end. And that's exactly what we're going to do. But first, let me briefly just introduce you to some terminology I'm going to use across the demo just to make sure that we're all on the same page. So in the demo of Intoto, there's a piece called functionaries and that are people that are like involved inside the software the supply chain, right? Functionaries for that matter. And they are all being identified with a public key inside the supply chain and they have their own private key that will keep that they that will keep that close to them, right? They don't want to share it with everybody. So there's a developer, there's a packager, um, and there's a project owner, which in case it will be me. And as a project owner, I will define how the software supply chain looks. 
right? So that's the first step. The project owner defines the supply chain laying out and describes what will happen by who. So that's that's the relation. And what products will be produced, like materials and byproducts, right? And each of the steps will produce link metadata, which we will see in the demo. And that's the output of the executed step. Materials are input and products are output, but products can also be used as materials in the next step, right? So, uh, and I think that's the key essence, right? So at some point, the developer will do a thing and sign off its work, her, um, her his work, and then that will be used by the packager and that that's a chain, right? And that's all being signed by the people who are allowed to do it, the functionaries. So that's in essence a demo. So let me switch over to my VS Code. And that's the other side. So what we see over here is a Intoto demo that's been inspired by the Intoto demo you find on the website, but I only involved a .NET application. And first we need to create a layout and that's me myself as the owner. There's a Python script that will eventually produce a layout that looks something like this. Let me quickly show you a bit what I mean about that. Um, so there's a lot of things in. Don't, don't pay too much attention, but keep in mind that each of the steps that might be expected materials as output, but that also will be ties to who is allowed to do it, like who, uh, which role is allowed to do it. Um, there's development keys, like every key comes together, uh, public keys of the developer uh, role and so on. And these are all like interchangeable, right? So it's not that it's been written in stone and everybody um, needs to like do their step at this point. No, it's, it's dynamic, right? So this layout will be signed by myself as a owner. So I have a private and a public key and that layout is something that we're then gonna use and the final product to verify it because that will explain to us um, how it looks and, and what it is, right? Um, let me quickly do one thing before we continue. So let me safeguard that layout. Okay, cool. So now let's move on. Let's say the developer starts out developing because that's the first step, right? So we can uh, go into demo and there's in Toto. And there's the functionary by the name of MA and she's the developer of it all. And there is a script and what that script does is this, right? So um, in Toto allows you to define steps, right? That's a supply chain and also allows you to record. And what I'm doing right now is nothing more than just defining a new console app, starting out a new console app. And then we define products that are the output of this, but in this case, it's a source file, right? So let's say create and this create will start out. There's an app folder being created inside of this and that's the artifact. So let's say uh, the development is done and you also see a link file being produced and that's all the signing that's being done by the developer saying like, hey, I produced this file. This is the signature of that file and I'm signing it with my public key. So this is an artifact we're going to need for the final product verification. And let's now move on because the developer is done. Let's say the packager needs to do his work. In that case, that's now. So now just going to check out the code and he has the code now inside of his local machine. And we're going to move to his folder. And let's say now it first is going to do a publish, which is nothing more than just a .NET publish that will take care of some of the package steps he needs to do. That will then be executed and that will result in a link file that we're going to use, right? So that will define that now it has taken this step as a packager. And then we're going to say packaged whole and make sure that we deploy the app, which is the package script. And what that will do is then create a tar that contains the binaries inside of it and also a supporting link file, right? So these are all the artifacts that we're going to produce at this point. And what we can then do as a product owner or as anybody else, if somebody then eventually publishes these files with the release done, you can verify. And in Todo allows you to verify it. And that looks something like this. So you can say in Todo verify, this is the layout of the supply chain and there's a public key involved from the owner itself. And I want to sh I want to just make sure that we check it all. And what we see over here, the defined software supply chain has been valid validated. And we say like, hey, the product uh, passes all verifications and passes and passes all the steps being defined inside the software supply chain. It's all done in the right way. But what about there's a hack or something else happens, right? Because we want to see that. 
let's say for some reason now decides to do some development um, because hey why not you can uh, do some uh, things so let's move back to uh, the program cs that now has grabbed from and let's say we're going to say uh, hello ddd 2020 i'm going to save it and don't ask me again because i'm not going to build it like this and let's say right now now it is doing its thing so it's doing first a publish right that will produce a new publish link file that we're going to put inside the um the output hold on a second that one that needs to go up here publish and then we're going to do the same package right that's similar that's the package step let me quickly I've increased the fonts a bit larger so I need to make sure that I put it in the right folder and this one of course that's the artifact itself let me quickly move that one up so if we now go back to the final product and um, yeah, root layout is still there I published still there so let's say in total verify I would do the same then we see over here is that uh, at some point inside the software supply chain, the program CS file has been altered and it's not the program CS file that was checked in and signed by the developer, right? So this is an example of, let's say somebody who has no developer role inside the project decides to alter a thing and with all the link artifacts inside, you can verify that. So this is the demo. Uh, this is all, of course, pretty like academia. It's, I, I like the tool, how it works, but how can we fit it in, right? Datadog is a company who does analytics and they have an agent build pipeline that solely relies on Intoto uh, to, verify, to verify their builds. Definitely go check it out if you're interested in that a bit more. If you run on Saito GPC on Google Cloud Platform, uh, GraphVS and Cretus are tools that will allow you to also incorporate uh, in total metadata, right? Graphius is the metadata API that stores the data and Cretus allows you to take decisions at deploy time. So you can verify a supply chain, say like, hey, does it meet all my standards? And if it's true, then you can say, deploy this Docker image into that cluster and then you're good to go. Or you can decide not to do it, right? And with Azure Pipeline's artifact policy, we can do exactly the same. Right now, it allows you to check, I believe, hey, is this port open and so on, but ingesting data like in total can also be possible in this step right so i think this is um this is the good thing i'm getting close to the end and i'm i, I overrun a bit but i want to make sure that i keep some time open for questions um i think we need to conclude that make sure that you're aware of your own software supply chain but also the ones you implicitly use inside your software right as i showed you build servers images libraries they are all moving parts and it has become more complex, but it also gives the attackers more opportunities to, um, to to manipulate your software. And it's good to know like what you're consuming inside your software, right? What libraries are you using and so on and, and consider using an SBOM for that matter in order to identify those things. Please do use multi-factor authentication on all your accounts and this is a bit of an open door and we can even talk about another hour about software, secure, software security as a whole, but security needs to be part of your development life cycle, right? You cannot bolt it on at the end. It needs to be there from beginning to the end with with trap modeling, with, with secure coding, with, with analysis and at the end testing, pen testing maybe even, right? That's a whole chain and you cannot replace it with doing the things that I've just shown you. And it would be good to introduce you to like go to software bill of materials that I talked about the NTIA website or in total go check it out or go to the, the GitHub repo that I put down and it's in, in DDD 2020 in my in my GitHub. You can find all the slides, the notes as I talked about and the demo you just saw with um, with in total. And with that said, um, let's check out if there are any questions being asked or not. So. Let me open up the the overview and I think it's pretty silent right now and that's completely fine. Um, yeah, so please feel free to reach out to me on my email or on Twitter if you've got any questions. And I would say thank you for attending this. Thank you for attending DDD and hope to see you next time.
I cannot hear you, Richard. I think you're still on mute. Thank you. <laughs> no Not for the first time today. <laughs> just thank you. Just thanking Neil there for uh, his uh, his excellent session. Really interesting. Um, thanks for attending. All the, I hope you found all the other se sessions. Uh, oh, we do have one question has just popped in, which is how do we do codes? How do you do code signing? Code signing. So there's a difference between uh, taking certificates and authentic code and sign your code, right? That's one step. Um, and the other one is the, maybe the git commit signing that I briefly touched. That's, of course, a step you will do based on your source code, right? That will just sign off the chain set that will have a, a thumbprint or fingerprint of that chain set that can then be tracked down if it's altered or not. Code signing itself, um, authentic code certificates, you can do it. Um, there's a lot like if you go to docsmicrosoft.com, you can probably find a lot about it. The only thing that I want you to be aware of is that even if you have code signing inside your supply chain, inside your build process, it gives you no guarantee that your supply chain will be safe. Like I usually have the thing like, hey, I use a third party library. It's signed by a certificate. I can probably assume that it's it's the right thing. And then I always need to say like no, because be aware that as I showed the build server or maybe some other dependency, if that one is being compromised in that chain, um, then even that sign package will be compromised. There's a nice example of Asus. They had an update, a piece of software update there that's installed on, on their machines, which turned out to have malware inside of it, but it ticked all the boxes. It was signed. You could not uh, distinct it uh, between the real deal or if it was something bad. And you can only check it by looking at its internals, right? So yes, authentication or, or like signing code can help out, but it's no guarantee. Even strong naming assemblies, that's the other one, um, is no security countermeasures. Uh, you can you can go to docs.microsoft.com, search for strong naming and security. You will find a big disclaimer at the top. This can only help you out on uniquely identifying an assembly, and that's its whole purpose, but you cannot use it for security guarantees for that same matter as I talked about with, let's say, having a certificate. There's even open source repos that will put in that private key that allows you to sign, to do that code signing in the same way because it's only the identity and it gives no guarantee of the integrity of the package and what's inside. Let me see if there's anything else. How do you check the only get signed NuGet packages to ensure integrity of the packages? So there's a good post that was done by um, Phil Hack uh, on NuGet and signing and also having packages that were signed by authors, right? So um, I think the example was um, Nate McMaster is signing off stuff, but in order to fully trust that, that's hard because then every package needs to be signed. And I think that's a hard one to solve. And that's exactly what Phil also put inside his blog post. Like you can, you can trust somebody that has a certificate that will be uh, if, if I want to have a code signing certificate that's tied to myself, then I probably even need to make a phone call with a specific authority claiming like, hey, I need to hold up a passport like, hey, I'm Niels and I want to have this certificate so people can trust that identity. Um, but that's still a, a hard problem because they don't cover the whole ecosystem. What you can do as an alternative with NuGet is trust specific publishers, right? So that's the step in between. And you can consider doing that in order to reduce it, right? The other thing you also see if, if you have a big company that there might be some curation done on the packages that you're allowed to use, right? So there might be a repo that's inside the, your, your organization bounds that will give them more control over what you're consuming or not, right? That's the alternative. But um, sign NuGet packages, same, same cost, won't give you any guarantee of what's inside. You can probably trust the person that published it, but still, um, if it's all automated and if it's all doing a, a, a single step and pulling that single package that's been compromised, then and I'm, I'm going to be paranoid, right? That's me. That's my job. But um, it's good to have some sense of what's happening, but it gives you no guarantee. Good questions. Oh. All right, cool. Well, thank you again. And yeah. uh, that's really interesting session and look out for videos of many of these sessions that should be appearing on the YouTube channel for DDD in the not too distant future, but we do have 50 odd sessions to get processed. So it will take us a little while. Thanks nice again. Yeah, and thanks I'll end this DDD stream. Volunteers for, for helping out the organization. Hopefully next time in person. Let's see how it goes. Thanks everyone. <laughs>